If footage like this and headlines like this remind you of the Cold War space race, you wouldn't be the only one. In what could only be described as a second space race, the United States and its allies seem to be competing with China and its allies in a variety of space-related arenas, more than ever before. From space stations and moon bases to satellite constellations and satellite constellation destroying missiles, the sky is the limit. And this isn't just the standard race and technological superiority, this has gotten political. The US has drafted the Artemis Accords, which consists of 32 signing countries agreeing to the safe exploration of the moon. Meanwhile, China drafted the International Lunar Research Station Agreement between itself, Russia, Belarus, Venezuela, and more to come. All countries very much politically opposed to the countries of the Artemis Accords, which might not be a mistake. Alongside devaluing the quote that borders can't be seen from space after all, this feels an awful lot like Cold War style one-upmanship, competing in any battlefield but a real one to prove that your own country or coalition's methods and ideologies are the best. And if you're like me, this division makes you curious. What led to space being an arena for geopolitical competition? Why are these lines so firmly drawn between mostly democratic and authoritarian countries? And which system is better? Let's explore it, and be sure to stay to the end for an exciting announcement. The answer to our first question takes us back to the Soviet Union at the height of its power. Recently victorious over Germany in World War II and now faced with a growing rivalry against America, the Soviet government knew that if it wanted to outcompete its enemies, it needed an edge on every battlefield and every frontier. During both world wars, they'd seen firsthand how technological superiority could create such a decisive advantage in times of conflict, and at the time, there was no greater frontier than space. It represented a new way of waging war, stopping their rivals, and making scientific breakthroughs that, in turn, solidified Soviet socio-economic dominance. With the launch of Sputnik, the Soviet Union staked its entire center of innovation on space. And the winds would just keep coming. More on that later. But the Americans saw these victories and felt threatened. Sputnik's launch came as a not-so-pleasant surprise to America. In the US, space was seen as the next frontier, a logical extension of the grand American tradition of discovery, and almost overnight, it became a cultural and politically paramount reason to keep up with the Soviet space program. Thus, the space race was born, and with it came new government agencies, science and technology, and national pride tied to the very culture of these countries. This pride, this culture of competition through discovery, would shape nearly 80 years of history, and if you're a futurist like me, you recognize how it will shape the next 80, this time with some new players in the mix. Now we get to answer our second question. Why does space seem to get carved up between capitalist and communist, or at least authoritarian countries? While the US and USSR did compete directly, they also shared their technology and ideology with their allies. Since these two superpowers set the stage, everyone else could only act the script. A prime example is China, which due to its shared political motivations and communist ideology, was one of the USSR's most important partners. They received Soviet rocket technology to develop missiles and eventually turn those missiles skyward. And as they watched the sparring and successes between the USA and USSR, they quickly determined that they needed equal footing. After the launch of Sputnik, Mao Zedong was quoted as saying, we too need satellites. Since then, China has made tremendous advances in space technology, carrying on that urge to prove that their socioeconomic system is the best. Not quite communist anymore, not quite capitalist, something in between, yet certainly authoritarian, that wants to show the world what it can do. And that desire has led us to today, with a second space race to return to the moon, build new stations, and perhaps culminate in a journey to Mars. But could either system be described as better, and what key differences separate them both? The answer would vary person to person. Both Western and Eastern space programs have had tremendous successes and horrible failures. The Soviets launched the first satellite, first animal, first man, first woman, first probes to the moon, Venus, and Mars, and launched the first space station. Quite the resume. Then America put the first man on the moon itself. That's one small step for man, and one giant step for mankind. Which was apparently the one thing the Soviets, and no other nation, could do. Contrary to its American and European competitors, who run their programs under a single coordinating agency, the Soviet space program was divided and split among several internally competing departments. These design bureaus were led by numerous engineers and rocket scientists, all of them vying for power. This might have limited communication, but a minimized bureaucracy, which explains the unbeatable speed the Soviet space program enjoyed. This was a feature that China didn't carry into its own space program, instead opting for the top-down approach, sprinkled with some commercial innovation. 
And this commercial innovation is truly where the Western and by extension Chinese space programs thrive. Seeing this success over the past 20 years, Russia has gradually increased commercial incentives through contracts and grants as well. Both systems have encouraged commercial innovation, but it really took the US commercial space sector successes, mainly by companies like SpaceX, to convince the rest of the world. Now the Chinese and American space industries are surprisingly similar, with a central government agency providing contract opportunities for companies to compete for. However, while the US industry is a free market, albeit with extremely close ties to the government, China's space industry is highly militarized. China's military oversees all of its launches, all its satellites, all its control centers, and its entire Taikonaut program. Three of the biggest celebrities of the moment in China. Two veteran Taikonauts and one rookie were greeted by waving flags and military honors before their Sunday morning launch time. The scene similar to those for the Soviet Union's Sputnik cosmonauts and American Mercury astronauts in the 1950s and 60s. But that hasn't slowed them down. China conducts the second most orbital launches per year second behind only the United States. Currently, most of the space activities carried out by China are managed by the China National Space Administration, or CNSA, and the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, which directs the Astronaut Corps and the Chinese Deep Space Network for their probes on the Moon and Mars. China's most notable projects include the Changi Lunar Rover Program, Mars Tianwen-1 Rover, and the Chang'an Space Station currently the only other space station from the ISS in orbit. Despite past reliance on Russian rocket technology, China has been able to accomplish all of this on its own. But the problem with working alone is that there's often only so far you can go. Western space programs have seen phenomenal success through international diversification, which has minimized supply chain risks and granted a wider talent pool than if any of these countries had been doing this on their own. The ISS alone was made by a partnership between five different space agencies across 15 separate countries. Meanwhile, China was internationally banned from the ISS for fears of technology theft. In other words, China has been forced to act on its own, but it's starting to see the value of teamwork. China's Lunar Pact has been soliciting interest from other rising geopolitical powerhouses like Saudi Arabia and India, giving a rise to the competing deep space treaties we now see today. There's no denying that for as efficient as the Soviet and Chinese space programs have proven themselves to be, that they all still have a lot of ground to cover between them and the current Western space programs. The race is on, and it's sure to be an exciting one. Nearly 50 years after the famous American-Soviet handshake in space symbolically ended the first space race, we can look forward, perhaps hoping that one day, Western and Eastern space explorers can have their own handshake on the moon. Or maybe even Mars. That's it for today's video, but if you're interested in seeing more content from me like this, don't hesitate to orbit around that subscribe button. It helps me out a lot. And keep watch for some exciting new videos I'll actually be filming from Russia to document the experience of my father's next launch on the Russian Soyuz rocket in September 2024. You won't want to miss it. Fall to stay in the loop.